the the fundamental identities topic. We actually don't have any prerequisite material we can talk about for that. Um, there's nothing you've encountered in 171 that um, honestly is even kind of remotely similar to working with fundamental identities in 172. So what we're the only thing we actually have to talk about this week related to the current week's topics is inverse functions, and we're going to do that. We'll do kind of a review from 171 and uh, talk about how that applies to your topic this week in 172. Next week, you're going to talk a whole lot more about uh, various identities in 172, and when that when you start doing that next week, we will be able to kind of come back and make some prerequisite or have some prerequisite conversations about the identities topic from this week. So that's that's getting to what I said a, a minute or two ago. So once you're in week five next week, we will get to talk back about some topics from week four, the identities topic from this week, and show how those ideas get uh, employed or get applied during week five. But for this week, the only topic we have for prerequisite stuff is inverse functions. And so you answered three questions, all three of the questions in the survey you just completed. They all deal with inverse trig or inverse functions. We eventually are going to work our way to inverse trig functions, but for the moment, we're going to talk about inverse functions that you saw back in 171. So an inverse function or a function and its inverse, what they do is undo each other. So an example of an inverse of a function and its inverse would be if f of x is x squared and g of x is the square root of x. Those are inverses of each other, right? G undoes what's happening in F. Another example is if F of X equals X plus three, then G of X, its inverse would be X minus three. Again, they're undoing each other. Um, essentially, one's canceling out what the other one does. So there's a couple things to do with inverse functions, one of the things you did back in 171 was actually to find a function's inverse. So let's say we have a function f of x equals 2x plus 7. One thing we can do with that is to find the inverse of f. How we do that, there was a series of four steps um, only one of those steps involved any sort of algebra, but what the steps were, the first one was to replace f of x with y. The second step was to swap x and y. The, the third step is to solve for y. And then the fourth step was to replace y with f of f inverse of x. So the only one of these steps that actually involves any sort of real math is number three. We're, um, we'll go through these as, as a review, but just kind of a disclaimer before we do that. No port, you won't have to do any portion of this inside of 172 this week. None of this is none of this has anything to do with trig per se. Um, we're doing this as a review of inverse functions from 171. And the, the biggest reason for that is that if it conjures up any sort of uh, memories that have been kind of tucked away since you were last in 171, that, that's kind of the hope here. We'll make some connections from some of the stuff we're doing to where it applies in 172, but obviously taking a function like this and finding its inverse isn't a task in 172 because there's no trig involved in what we're looking at right here. But to practice finding an inverse anyway, what we'll do first is replace f of x with y. And then we'll swap x and y. And then we'll solve this equation back for y. We'll do that by subtracting 7 from both sides. And then dividing everything by 2. So that tells us that y equals x minus 7 over 2. The f so all of this, let's see, this was step one. Step two occurred here, and then step three 
occurred everywhere below that. And then the last step, step four, is just to replace y with f inverse of x. And the whole point of making that replacement is to say, hey, this function you're looking at, this x minus 7 over 2, it's a function, but it's not some random function. It's actually a specific function, specifically the inverse of f from the beginning. Questions about those four steps, or about finding the inverse. Again, it's, it'll take me um, about 20 or 25 minutes to ultimately get to where we need to be and how this applies to 172. But like I said, this isn't a task you'll actually be performing for the week, but it's kind of a stepping stone to get to where we need to be. Okay, so. Um, one of the three questions you answered in the survey dealt with finding the inverse of a function. This is how we find the inverse of a function. We're going to do one more of these in a second. But the second, que another question you had, I think this, the third question in that survey deals with composing functions. So remember what it means to compose functions. If we wanted to compose we wanted to compose two functions f with g. What this means is that G becomes the input for F, right? So a composition of function occurs when we put one function inside of another. And the, that, that may seem unrelated, um, but the reason that that's a question here, the reason that that's a topic here is because when we compose a function with its inverse, we actually get back a very specific result. So let's say we compose, let's say F and G are inverses of each other. So let's suppose that G is the inverse of F. If we perform the composition, if we do F compose with G, what that's going to leave us with is just X. So if we compose inverses, the result of that that work just leaves us with f or sorry just leaves us with x and so let's look at that i'm actually going to scroll this up just a little bit so we can look at f and its inverse so if we wanted to compose f with f inverse we would replace the x in the original function, right? The original function was 2x plus 7. But where that, where that x was, we need to put the inverse function. We need to put the, the inside, right? This input piece goes in the parentheses there. No, I've not done too much. So we need to put the inverse function inside the parentheses there, and that's x minus 7 over 2. And simplifying this, if we've correctly found the inverse, simplifying this is going to give us back x. The 2's cancel, and we're left with x minus 7 plus 7. We can combine the 7's to get just x. So yeah, we found the inverse. We, we thought it was the inverse when we performed this composition. It works out appropriately there, too. Questions about anything we've done here. We're going to do another one, but questions about this one. Okay, so I'm going to scroll that down. I'll jot down a new function and I'll draw down a new function and actually give you a moment to try solving to find to try finding the inverse of this one. So the Q root of 2x and then minus 4 is on the outside of the radical. I'll give you a, a minute or so to practice applying those the four steps from earlier to this one and then we'll check it in a second.
Uh, would it be x minus 4, all of that raised to the third over 2? Um, close, not, not oh, minus. Um, plus 4, plus 4, yeah, I got that one messed up. Yeah, plus 4, I think that's right. Okay, so let's see. Step 1 is to replace y or f inverse with y. Then we'll swap x and y. And then solve this equation for y. To do that, next we'll add 4. Then we'll raise this to the third power to get rid of the cube root. And then finally, to get y by itself, we'll divide by 2. So yeah, Donovan, I think this is what you said. x plus 4, all to the third power, and then divided by 2. The last step, step 4, just kind of a notational change. We need to replace the y with f inverse, just, just so that we're actually making a note of, of what this really is. This is a function, of course, but it's specifically the inverse of f that we started with in the beginning. So again, just kind of the, the disclaimer one more time, you won't be doing this type of uh, answering this type of question in 172. The point of what we'll be doing this week in 172 is actually using inverse trig functions. And that's ultimately where we're going to end our time together. We're, gonna, we're eventually going to make it there. We're still though reviewing some stuff from 171 at the moment. All right. So this is the inverse of f. Let's take a second and check out that composition like we did earlier. It's going to be a little um, trickier here, just there's more going on. But let's look at the composition f composed with f inverse. So what that means is that we should recopy f, but where f originally had an x, we need to put f inverse instead. Right? So originally there was an x here, we don't need to put the x anymore. We need to put f inverse. And what f inverse is, is way down here. But that's x plus 4 to the third divided by 2. And then we'll simplify this and hope we get x. Not, I mean, hope is, um, we're not quite hoping. If we've done our job correctly with finding the inverse, it's going to work out. But the 2's cancel. And so we get the cube root of x plus 4 to the third minus 4. The cube root and the exponent of 3 cancel, leaving us with x plus 4 minus 4. And then the 4s cancel, leaving us with just x. Again, going back to what we said earlier, that's what should happen if these functions are actually inverses of each other. And it does. So uh, questions about any portion of that? Again, just a review from 171. But questions about anything we've we've said or done? Okay, so um, you answered two survey, three survey questions. Two of them we've chatted about already. Finding the inverse, that's what we did on the left side of both of these last two. Composing, that's what we did here in red. Above, we did it in uh, blue. I meant to kind of stick to the same colors. But composing functions is when one function becomes the input for the other. And we actually get a very specific result when we compose inverse functions. OK. The last thing to review about uh, functions and inverses from 171 is the relationship between the domain and range. So let's say we have the a function f and it has a domain 4 to infinity and it has a range negative infinity to negative 1. We get a pretty similar looking domain and range for f inverse as well. So think about what we just did above in step 2. 
for finding these inverse functions. What we did, so in step one, we had y on the left and x on the right, but in step two, we swapped them, right? We literally took x and y and switched spots. In terms of domain and range, what we did is take the domain for original, we took the original domain and the original range, and they switched spots. So that's exactly what happens to the domain and range for the function and its inverse as well. The original domain swaps to be the range for the inverse function. The original range swaps and is in fact the domain for the inverse function. Right, that's again just kind of by virtue of how we how we find this inverse, how we find these inverse functions. Part of the process, the second step in the process is to take X and Y and they switch spots, which literally means we're switching the domain and range. And so this is the relationship that exists between the domain and range of a function and its inverse. Questions about that relationship? Okay, so let's just to practice one of those. Let's say the F inverse has a domain of negative infinity to infinity, but its range is negative infinity to one union one to infinity. I'm gonna give you a minute to identify the domain and range for F, if you will. Or to at least think about it. I mean, obviously this isn't, um, you know, you don't have to turn any of this in or anything, but let's take a second to think about it, if you will. So we're kind of going the other direction now. We're starting with the inverse information, and I'm asking you to tell me the functions original information, but it's the same thing. The domain for the inverse exactly matches the range for the original function, what I'm, I'm putting quotes around original, and the range for the inverse exactly matches, um, it's not negative one, exactly matches the domain for the original function. But that's that is the relationship that that exists between a function and its inverse. So all of that to get us to this point where we're actually going to going to now share where this applies and how how you'll be using this this week. Some of you uh, will be using it with me, I, in fact. But um, where wherever you are in 172, you'll get to use some of these things when you're working with inverse trig functions. So, uh, two weeks ago, I think, I think it was in week two of the class, you answered questions using the unit circle. So you saw questions like sine of pi over six, and we're expected to use the unit circle to figure out what is the sine of pi over six. And you saw questions like tangent at three pi over four, and we're expected to use the unit circle to figure out what is the tangent at three pi over four. So, um, what you would do is I'll add a circle here for us. But what you could have done What you would have done is oh my gosh, sorry, I'm trying to make the, I'm trying to make it straight, but also large enough that we can read it. Uh, what you would have done is take the angle, too much. Take the angle you're, you were given, pi over six, go to that angle on the circle, and then tell me either back x or y, whatever we need. In this case, we need y since we're asked for the sine ratio at pi over six. Sine at pi over six is a half. Tangent at three pi over four, same kind of thing. You would go to the angle three pi over four, 
Tangent is sine over cosine, so we'll do that. We can make that division. And that gave us or gives us an answer of negative one. So tangent at three pi over four is negative one. What we're doing this week, how the inverse functions work, is the reverse of that. So questions you'll see this week are going to look like inverse sine of one half or inverse tangent of negative one. So what you'll need to do is use the circle, still using the circle, but you're going to need to first go to the correct ratio. And then the answer to this is going to be an angle. So we'll start, we'll, we'll locate the correct ratio along the circle. And the answer is going to be the associated angle. Unlike before, what we were looking at before, we had an, we started with an angle and ended with a ratio. We started with an angle and ended with a ratio. So this is getting to the idea that we talked about when finding the inverse that we most recently talked about with the domain and range, but literally we're swapping the information we're using. Right? So if we're using a typical sine function, we start with an angle, the answer is a ratio. For its inverse, we start with a ratio, the answer is going to be an angle. So that's how these work. We're still going to be using the circle. If you have a unit circle that you've, you've already drawn, um, you know, of course, you may want to grab it and have it out. We're going to talk about how this works. We're going to do a couple of examples. Um, but having a unit circle um, with whatever source of helpful information you'd like to have on it is a good idea. So what, what do I mean? So the circle I have over here, I'm going to add a new one down below. But the circle that I've got is just a picture that I use when I'm making videos or whatever. But it doesn't, you know, it has some helpful information. It doesn't have everything we might need, but it has some stuff. So what, what else might be helpful? Well, it might be helpful to write the tangent ratios up here on um, sine over cosine. All right, so if you wanted to jot down the tangent ratios, that might be a cool thing to have in your unit circle. If you wanted to write down the secant, cosecant, and cotangent ratios, that might be a cool thing. I'm not saying you should or, or whatever, but the point of the circle, and we talked about this if you were here uh, last week, but or maybe two weeks ago, but the whole point is to just summarize these uh, ratios so that we can conveniently locate them and use them to answer questions. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't really do anything else. It's just a collection of angles with associated trig ratios with them. But it's just a tool that we use when we're answering questions. And so um, having it in its most usable or most helpful format for you is a good idea. So if you have a circle that you routinely use to do homework um, and just study for the class, then having, you know, feel free to label it with all these other ratios if you want to do that. The unit circle is not given on the test, so you will need to be able to construct your own. You know, so if you want one constructed with all sorts of other ratios, just make sure you can do it yourself. Um, but, you know, having a, a useful one while you're working is a good idea. So what for whatever that means, I'm not saying you need to put all these additional things, but feel free, of course, to to add to your unit circle, whatever you find helpful. OK, um, so I'm actually going to take those tangent ratios away because I'm going to draw something else on this circle. But when we're working with inverse trig functions, they don't, we're not going to get just any random group of answers. What we're going to get is the answers we can get are based on the, the inverse function we're using. So if we're using the inverse sine function or the inverse tangent function, We're only going to get back answers in quadrant one or quadrant four. 
so this is kind of this is pretty specific. This isn't a prerequisite thing that I'm saying. This is actually really specific to the class for the week, but I'm throwing it out here now because we're going to use it when we kind of need this to to complete or to talk about the last portion of our conversation for the day. But inverse sine and inverse tangent, they only provide angles in quadrant one or quadrant four. Remember, that's what we're getting from all of these. For these inverse functions, a ratio goes in and angle comes out. But the angles for the inverse sine and inverse tangent only work in quadrant one or four. In addition to that, it's not actually the angles in quadrant four that you see, but it's negative angles instead. So instead of 11 pi over six, we would get back negative pi over six. Instead of seven pi over four, we're gonna use negative pi over four. Instead of five pi over three, we're gonna use negative pi over three. But inverse sine and inverse tangent return angles between negative pi over two and pi over two. And actually, um, instead of three pi over two, we'll need to use negative pi over two. But inverse sine and inverse tangent only give angles between negative pi over two and pi over two. Inverse cosine is obviously not in the list that we wrote above in red, but inverse cosine only gives us back angles between zero and pi. We don't need to change those angles. We don't need to mark any of them out. We can use exactly what's written there. But it's so important that inverse trig functions, they only give us back specific values in two quadrants. It's either quadrant one or four if it's inverse sine or inverse tangent, or quadrant one or two if it's inverse cosine. But we're not looking along the whole circle. We're only looking in the two quadrants where that inverse function works. There's more to the story. I'll leave the conversation. I'll leave the more portion of that story up to whoever teaches your class if they want to, if that's something that they're going to dive into. You know, you can hear it there. But for now, we'll just, you know, it, it is so important, though, to note that they only work in two quadrants. All right. So what we do, the kinds of questions we're going to answer. We looked at, at some of them above. So let's say we have inverse sine of a half. What we're going to do is glance around the circle, looking at the sine ratios. That's the y values over here. We're going to look at. We're going to look at the y values. And find whichever one is a half. But it has to be in the correct quadrant. So inverse sine. We're relegated to looking in the, the two red quadrants in either quadrant one or quadrant four. Between these two, we need to locate the one y value of a half. It's right there. And we need to identify the associated angle. Again, remember the answers to all of these inverse functions is an angle. So inverse sine one half, the associated angle is pi over six. So let's say we're looking at inverse tangent of negative one. I'm going to write down, I think I used to have the tangent values. I'm going to put them back. I'm going to write them out here in, in black off to the side. Okay, so again, making, if you have a unit circle, of course, if you want to write the tangent ratio as long as your circle, you can. So let's say that we need to figure out um, inverse tangent of negative one. What that means is we need to look around the circle, only in the two quadrants where we're uh, relegated to looking, which in this case is one and four, and find the angle associated with the tangent value of negative one. Well, tangent is negative one right here in where I'm circling in blue. The associated angle, that's the answer to our question, but that angle is negative pi over four. So inverse tangent of negative one is negative pi over four. 
that's your task for this week or part of your task. It gets, there's a little more that you're going to explore in the class, but this is um, a big chunk of it. Let's do, we haven't done a cosine one. Let's do one of those. Inverse cosine negative square root of three over two. So what that means, so we should look in quadrant one or two. That's where inverse cosine works in quadrant one or two. Find the cosine ratio that's negative square root three over two and grab the associated angle with that ratio. So we start with the ratio. It connects us to an angle, but that angle is the solution to the question. In this case, five pi over six. Questions about anything we've done there? Um, um, will the answer ever require us to answer in rate? I mean, degrees instead of radians. Say that one more time. You're, it's kind of breaking up at the beginning. What did you say? Oh, will we ever have to answer in degrees and uh, radians? Um, the default is radians. So I don't. I mean, you could answer in degrees. I I don't. Off the top of my head, I'm not aware of any time you would be asked to do that, though. Generally, it's radians. They work in degrees. I mean, it's the same kind of thing, right? I mean, instead of uh, pi over 6 radians, we could say 30 degrees. Instead of negative 5 or 4, we could say negative 45 degrees. I just don't. The only time you would answer in degrees is if you're specifically asked to do that, only because the default is radians. OK, yeah, but I don't I mean, I'll never ask you to answer in degrees. I don't think WebAssign probably ever asked you to answer in degrees. So um, the answer is you can, but the follow up is I don't think you will need to. Or be asked to. Other other questions about anything we did here, requests to maybe do another one. If, um, Again, my, my point is not to teach the whole topic. I'm happy to do more if you want to do more, but the point is to make the connection between um, the inverse functions from earlier and the actual inverse trig functions you'll see in class. And of course, uh, I'm happy to talk more about them if there's a need or request. Um, to that point, though, uh, I just put a second survey link in the chat if you will. So this is actually the end of our of what I've got planned. We're supposed to spend about an hour doing the stuff that I've got planned. A little less time this week because, like we said at the beginning, the test takes up a big portion of your week and we actually only have the inverse topic to talk about. But I did go ahead and put the survey link in the chat. If you could take like 22 seconds real quick and complete the post survey, that's what this new link is. Totally different um, set of questions from earlier. The same question, just it goes to a different place. But if you could answer those three questions for me again real quick, I would sincerely appreciate it as always. But we have the rest of our time. We have 37 minutes left. We can spend that time doing anything you want to do. We can talk about questions you have from last week or for any of the earlier weeks questions for anything you've already encountered this week. It's only Monday, but if you got a head start on things, we can talk about stuff for this week. We can talk more about anything we've already said here today. You have a test this week if you want to have any questions about preparing for the test or any questions you've encountered in the test review or something like that where you know we can absolutely talk about any of those things too so 37 minutes of time we'll use that however y'all want me to use it but no matter what we do please 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 complete the survey for me i don't you know i i can't chase you down but um i really need you to do it and i would appreciate it if you did it unlike the survey at the beginning um i can't kind of hold you hostage with the session I can delay starting the session until we all complete it, but I can't keep you from leaving, of course. But please, please, please do it. I appreciate it. And three of you already have. Thank you. But any questions you have for me, feel free to ask those out loud or type them in the chat. Um, and we'll, we'll answer as many as we can do in our remaining half hour. Can you do another inverse unit? Yeah, for sure. So 
Let's do inverse tangent. Five square root three. So what this means, inverse tangent for the square uh, of the square root of three, it means look at these tangent values. I I wrote them on the outside over here in black, so that we could look at them. But we need to find where the square root of three occurs as a tangent ratio. That's up there. I'm circling it real thick and blue. And we need to grab, we just need to figure out the angle associated with it. And the angle at that spot is pi over 3. So inverse tangent of square, of square root of 3 is equal to pi over 3. Does that make sense, Caitlin? Yeah, OK, you're welcome. So it's um, the I, I, I kind of suggest maybe at least when you're starting off the week, if you don't, if, if you routinely use a, t a unit circle, you know, if you just have one already drawn that you always grab out and use that to, while you're working on the homework and stuff, I think it would probably be a really good really. I think it would probably be really helpful to write the tangent ratios in there, especially for this week, only because you may, you know, if you're asked for tangent at pi over three, you specifically know to go to pi over three and divide sine by cosine, right? So that's, you know, from two weeks ago, that's not too tedious of a process. But what we're doing this week, we need to identify where a specific tangent ratio occurs. So it would just be really helpful if we had all of the ratios to look at. So on. You know, again, just kind of my recommendation to draw the, to to include the tangent ratios. It would it would probably be helpful. Um, Breland, could you go over constructing the unit circle to find the radians? Yeah. Um, Sarah, you wrote terminal angles with a question mark. What do you mean by that? Do you want me to talk about about something? I'm not sure what you do. You mean coterminal angles? Like just kind of a refresher on what they are. When terminal angles isn't coterminal angles. An angle. Oh, 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 so just real quick, an angle has an initial side and a terminal side. But a terminal angle, that's not quite. We never said anything like that. So the only place terminal probably came up was for the terminal side of an angle. The coterminal angles is definitely a thing. Yeah, well, we can talk about coterminal angles in a second. So um, for drawing the unit circle, my recommendation is to um, start with the four axes. So and label those ordered pairs one zero zero one negative one zero and zero negative one. All right, these are all as a reminder, the unit circle is a circle that has a radius of one. So we're in one unit to the right, that's where the one zero comes from. One unit up, that's where zero one comes from. In addition to that, there are three angles in each of these quadrants. In quadrant one, and uh, before that, all of the angles, they all have a certain set of denominators. So the angle closest to the x-axis in each quadrant has a denominator of six. The middle angle is a denominator of four. The top angle is a denominator of three. This is always true. And there's some number in the numerators of all of these, and there's a pi with it. You know, in quadrant one, it's they all just have a pi. So pi over six, pi over four, pi over three. In quadrant two, the numerators are one less than the denominator. So two pi over three, three pi over four, five pi over six. Always one less than the bottom. 
In quadrant three, the tops are always one more than the bottom. So that's seven pi over six, five pi over four, four pi over three. In quadrant four, I don't really have a good kind of quick way. I mean, I have a way, I'm not sure. It's not as convenient as the other three, but in quadrant four, the numerators are one less than the double of the denominator. That's kind of a mouthful, but this denominator doubles to be six, one less than that is five. This denominator doubles to be eight, one less than that is seven. This denominator, the six doubles to be 12, one less than that is 11. Oh my gosh, what am I, what have I done? So Braylon, this is getting, I mean, this is your question. If you want me to say anything more or different, you know, let me know. I'm just going to kind of keep going through what's my typical explanation for this, unless I hear otherwise. Um, but then, so these are all the angles. Then we get to the, the ordered pairs, right? That's really, you know, that's a, a, a crucial part of what we need. The sine and cosine values come from the ordered pairs. Um, the ordered pairs follow a pretty typical pattern in two. In quadrant one, it's the square root of three over two with a half. The square root of two over two with this with the square root of two over two. And then one half with the square root of three over two. From here, we're going to take it's the same kind of situation as with the angles where all the denominators matched anything that has a denominator of three is going to have a pretty similar ordered pair so i'm just going to go around and fill in all the denominators of three they're all going to be one half with the square root of three over two except in quadrant two the x value needs to be negative in quadrant three, the X and Y both need to be negative, and in quadrant four, the Y needs to be negative. But all the ordered pairs have the same numbers. We're just going to make some of them negative when we need to do that. All of the denominators of four, they have the same ordered pair as well, square root of two over two with the square root of two over two. Like before, in quadrant two, the x's need to be negative. In quadrant three, x and y need to be negative. And then in quadrant four, y needs to be negative. All of the ordered, all of the um, ordered pairs with angles that have a denominator of six, they're going to be similar as well. It's the square root of three over two with a half. The square root of three over two with a half. And then the square root of three over two with a half. Again, quadrant four needs a negative y. Quadrant um, three needs negative X and negative Y. Quadrant two just needs a negative X. So I don't, um, maybe that's helpful. I don't know that I've been to point out a couple of things, you know, the denominators match, how to find some numerators. But a lot of it comes down to filling in the values in quadrant one and then moving them around you know, whether it's the angle or whether it's the ordered pairs, moving them around to their similar spots in the other quadrants. You know, if it's ordered pairs making things negative, they need to be negative. Breland, is that okay? Do you, have, do you want to talk more about it? Is there something else, something you're struggling with that I can maybe help clarify or something? OK, sure. So Sarah, you're asking about coterminal angles. Coterminal angles are angles that start and stop at the same spot. So for example, let's say we're looking at pi over 4. And negative 7 pi over 4. Those are coterminal angles because they start and stop at the same spot. Different angles. 
but they both start at the positive portion of the x-axis and they both ended inside of quadrant one at the pi over four angle there. So coterminal angles, this is kind of a, a generic definition, not really a, a great math specific definition, but coterminal angles start and stop at the same spots. The same spots as each other, not that it starts where it stops, but wherever one starts, the other one starts, wherever one stops, the other one stops. Your, your task for working with those, though, was really if, you know, if you were given an angle negative 21 pi over um, 4, really the question was to find an angle coterminal to this one. So starting at negative 21 pi over 4, find an angle, find a coterminal, let's phrase this way, find a coterminal angle. inside of typically inside of zero to two pi is what the instructions will say so you have this angle that's not inside zero to two pi and your task is to find a coterminal angle that was okay we can look at that negative five or seven one two and so what it, the task here and sarah if you're, this isn't what you were asking about let me know and we can you know do whatever it is that you want to do but this was the, the really the biggest task with coterminal angles was starting with the given angle and adding multiples of 2 pi until we got the given angle um and or got it got an angle inside of 0 to 2 pi okay so do you want me to keep going with this or no i was only doing this because i thought it was what you were asking but do you have is this Okay, all right. Um, no, I don't. Terminal angles isn't ringing a bell to me. I don't. Um, there's a like I said, there's a terminal side of an angle, but I don't. I don't know what you're. Nothing's jumping out at to me is what you mean by terminal angles. I think I just misread it on the PowerPoint. Okay, all right. If you. Can share the PowerPoint side with. I mean, if you have the PowerPoint open or something, you can. Send me that, I guess, and I can look look at it. We can talk more. There's a question I couldn't figure out to find the exact value using the reference angle for negative five or seven. What? Or Celia, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Can can you send me the question? Like, is it some somewhere you can easily find it or send it to me? Because just finding a value using oh never mind sorry i misread your question i don't need you to send me anything i don't no 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 i'm sorry i miss i misread your question well i i think i missed i don't know we can find the reference angle for negative five or seven so what a reference angle is i'll write that over here in red a reference angle is the positive and acute angle between the terminal side of a given angle and the x axis. It's kind of a mouthful. I'm going to draw a picture for it, but what it's saying is that scoot it up a little bit more if we have an angle in quadrant three right the the angle between the terminal side of that angle and the x-axis this is the reference angle so every angle you're going to look at has a terminal side it's going to be drawn in, on an X and Y plane, so there will be an X axis. Connecting your angle to the X axis will create the reference angle. And so for your angle negative pi over 7, that's down here in quadrant 4. The reference angle is this one. Again, I'm connecting your angle to the X axis, but that reference angle there, it's pi over 7. So 
the reference angle for negative pi over seven is pi over seven. Yeah, cool. So um, I don't mean to bring this up again. There's seven of you here. There's five. Five of you have completed the survey. The five of you who have, thank you. I appreciate it. Again, I will always be so thankful. Um, for the two of you who haven't, if you could still do it, I would be really thankful to you as well so that I can share that stuff, that information with the ILC. Uh, but uh, keep the questions coming. What other questions can we chat about? Don't forget, no calculators on test one, so you'll need to be able to simplify things, um, fractions, add fractions, multiply fractions, whatever, um, without a calculator. Um, can you go over graphing the functions, but not so sine and cosine, the other ones, like cosecant? Secant. Um, we can. Uh, is why are you asking? Will it be on the test? Um, yeah, I mean it could be on the test, but the learning objective for those other four functions is to create the basic graph that has no transformations applied. Oh, okay. And so the reason I hesitated a set for a second is because what I would recommend for those is um, just taking a second and looking at the basic graphs of those four and just kind of making a mental snapshot about how they look because you won't need to construct one on your own. If that makes any sense. Um, it's more of, and I hate to say this, I'm not a huge fan, it's more of memorize that these four are the basic four for untransformed graphs for those other functions and just know which ones match with which functions. Um, let's see. So these are the four off the top of my head. I'd need a second to make sure I'm going to label them correctly, and I can label them if you want. Um, undefined at zero. So this one's y equals cotangent. Oh, that's not cotangent. Oh, this one is sine over cosine sine 1 over sine cosecant. This one's y equals secant. And hopefully I've drawn that one correctly. <laughs> um, I think this one's going to be y equals tangent and y equals cotangent x. Hopefully I'm doing that right. Um, I, to be honest with you, I don't actually have them memorized. I, if I need to draw them, I do construct them from a table, kind of like what we did when we were making the general graphs. Um, so drawing them quickly from scratch isn't actually something I'm great at. And I have, I, <laughs> I don't have many of them right. I'm going to change this in a second. Oh my gosh, I wrote them all backwards. That's so embarrassing. Hold, I'm going to change all these in a second. I thought I was, I was remembering something in my head that I shouldn't have remembered. Um, so let's see. I'm going to change all my labels. So these are the general four graphs anyway. Let's take all these away. So we need... Um, let's do this. I'm just going to scroll this up a second and start from scratch. So if we needed to draw on let's say cotangent x that looks like this 
if we need to draw y equals tangent x, um, tangent x, it's going to be going the other direction. My recommendation, though, is um, if you have the, a PowerPoint somewhere that's kind of got these drawn, just look at these a few times and the, all you'll ever be expected to do on the test is to identify these four. Just their, again, just their basic graphs. Um, if you wanted to talk about constructing them by hand, we can, which is like I said, that's what I do with these. I don't. I'm really bad at memorizing things, as you just witnessed. Um, so I don't have them memorized. Um, if I wanted to make, if I wanted to graph them, I would create a table of values, which is a long process that I, is a bit more than what we need to do. So I, I don't suggest, I guess, making the graphs, the tables by hand, really. Other questions? Literally anything you got. If you know, um, I didn't. I could have said this earlier. If you, I mean, feel free to go when you get ready. If you're, you know, if you don't have any questions, of course you're, you're welcome to go. This, you're, no one's a hostage. This isn't a, a class kind of thing. I don't, you know, I don't think you should expect to stay for a class meeting. But whenever you're ready to go, feel free to do that. All I'll do is we'll stay as long as folks are asking questions. I'll be here until then. But. You've heard everything I've got planned for the day, the inverses stuff. So whenever you're ready to go, feel free to do that. But feel free to keep asking questions too. Whatever you have will answer. Um, could you go? Yeah, you're welcome, Donovan. Could you go over some? Yeah, do you have which ones? Sarah, what do you want to what about transformations do you want to review? Just want me to write a summary of the rules. Yeah. Breland, do you have specific questions from the review that you want to look at? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll do this. Uh, so, Sarah, these are the uh, basic rules. The D value tells us whether we're going up or down. It's up if we're adding. It's down if we're subtracting. B tells us left and right. Left if it's a um, plus sign in the parentheses. Right if it's a minus sign. Horizontal expansion or compression. Really, the most important thing there is the factor of 1 over A, uh, vertical expansion or compression. The most important thing there is the factor of C. So this is a summary of the rules. We, if you want to have a problem where we can practice applying, then we can do that. I'm going to look at eight. And the right thing, yeah. So Breland number eight is, uh, I don't want to slide that up too far. So eight says if sine is negative, and cosine is positive, which quadrant is theta in? This is right, this is the question, Breland. Am I on the right the right thing that you're asking about for number eight? Yeah, okay. So sine and cosine talk about along the unit circle, talk about the ordered pairs. So in quadrant one, they're both positive. In quadrant two, 
Um, co uh, cosine is negative and sine is positive. In quadrant three, they're both negative. In quadrant four, cosine is positive and sine is negative. So negative sine positive cosine means we're in quadrant four. Eight, thirteen, seven. So seven. I'm going to do seven next, just because it's neighboring to eight. So seven says to determine the sine, S I G N, of sine theta cosine theta. This is a pretty similar question. Hey! <coughs> Um, so it gets to the ordered pairs, the pluses and minuses with these ordered pairs. So if we're in quadrant three, that's here, that means sine is going to be negative, cosine is going to be negative, which means the, the answer to that is actually going to be a positive number. Negative times negative is going to be positive. Is that okay for eight and seven? Okay, um, let's see. I'll scroll back up and do three. P is on the circle. Determine the ordered pair if X is that. Okay. So we have a point on the unit circle. The point is point is on the circle that X coordinate is 9 over 41. So we have a point, the x coordinate is 9 over 41. We need to determine the the missing y value. You remember the, uh, and we're specifically told the y value is positive, which means we're going to be in quadrant one, a positive x and a positive y. But for any point on the unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals one. All, right, all points on the circle, that's true. Because for any point on the circle, we could turn it into a right triangle that has a hypotenuse of length one. In this case, the bottom side of the triangle is nine over 41, and we need to figure out why. The y, the y coordinate, the, the vertical side of the triangle. So nine over 41 squared plus y squared equals one. Nine squared is 81. 41 squared, ooh, ooh that big one to square. Um, this isn't a question you would probably, be, uh, for certain, this isn't a question you would be expected to do um, on on a test. I have honestly don't know what this what 41 squared is, so I'm not going to do it in my head. I'm going to do it in the calculator, though. 41 squared is 1681. So just to, I'm going to take a side step for a second. This is this question would be totally fine for a test if it wasn't 41. Maybe if it was like nine over 11 or something. Those that's small enough we could square that one by hand in our, our in our head or by hand, but 41 squared not really one to expect to do by hand on a test. Um, our task though in this process is to solve for y squared, which means next we should subtract 81 over 1681. That gives us y squared equals um, one written as a fraction with a denominator of 1681 is 1681 over 1681. And when we subtract 1681 minus 81, we get 1600 over 1681. And then square rooting both sides, the square root of 1600 is 40 and the square root of 1681 from earlier is 41. So the missing y component is 40 over 41. This would be a little more reason, like I said, this would be a little more reasonable for a test if instead the ordered pair was um, 9 over 11 with something though. Just having to deal with that 41 makes it a little uh, cumbersome, but that's the process anyway. 
Breland question. Do have, does that make sense what we did? Questions about anything we did? Why we did it, maybe? Oh, wait. And then uh, 713. So 13 is just this lengthy thing to evaluate. We've got a copy it right, I guess, first. That'll be helpful. So sine 45 degrees, cosine 60 degrees, plus sine 60, cosine 45. So all of these angles are on the unit circle. We can grab their sine and cosine values from there. Sine of 45 degrees is the square root of 2 over 2. Cosine of 60 degrees is a half. Sine at 60 is the square root of 3 over 2, and cosine at 45 is the square root of 2 over 2. Is that okay? Before we do the next piece, we're not finished, but is that okay? Grabbing all of those angles, grabbing all those ratios from the circle? Okay. And so what's next is to multiply these. We'll multiply these two together and multiply these two together. That's the square root of 2 over 4 plus the square root of 6 over 4. Since the denominators match, we can wrap all this up by writing it as the square root of 2 plus the square root of 6 over 4. 